Volume Three, Chapter Thirteen, Part B, of the Mysteries of Adolfo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Missy, Guangzhou, China. The Mysteries of Adolfo by Anne Radcliffe, Volume Three, Chapter Thirteen B. On the following day, when the Count had accidentally joined Emily in one of the walks, they talked of the festival of the preceding evening, and this led him to a mention of Valancourt. "'That is a young man of talent,' said he. "'You were formerly acquainted with him, I perceive?' Emily said that she was. "'He was introduced to me at Paris,' said the Count, "'and I was much pleased with him on our first acquaintance.' He paused, and Emily trembled between the desire of hearing more and the fear of shewing the Count that she felt an interest in the subject. "'May I ask,' said he at length, "'how long you have known Monsieur Valancourt?' "'Will you allow me to ask your reason for the question, sir?' said she, "'and I will answer it immediately.' "'Certainly,' said the Count, "'that is but just. I will tell you my reason. I cannot but perceive that Monsieur Valancourt admires you. In that, however, there is nothing extraordinary. Every person who sees you must do the same.' I am above using commonplace compliments. I speak with sincerity. What I fear is that he is a favoured admirer. Why do you fear it, sir? said Emily, endeavouring to conceal her emotion. Because, replied the Count, I think him not worthy of your favour. Emily, greatly agitated, entreated further explanation. I will give it, said he, if you will believe that nothing but a strong interest in your welfare could induce me to hazard that assertion. "'I must believe so, sir,' replied Emily. "'But let us rest under these trees,' said the Count, observing the paleness of her countenance. "'Here is a seat. You are fatigued.' They sat down, and the Count proceeded. "'Many young ladies, circumstanced as you are, would think my conduct on this occasion, and on so short an acquaintance, impertinent instead of friendly. From what I have observed of your temper and understanding, I do not fear such a return from you.' Our acquaintance has been short, but long enough to make me esteem you, and feel a lively interest in your happiness. You deserve to be very happy, and I trust that you will be so." Emily sighed softly and bowed her thanks. The Count paused again. "'I am unpleasantly circumstanced,' said he, "'but an opportunity of rendering you important service shall overcome inferior considerations. Will you inform me of the manner of your first acquaintance with the Chevalier Valancourt, if the subject is not too painful?' Emily briefly related the accident of their meeting in the presence of her father, and then so earnestly entreated the Count not to hesitate in declaring what he knew, that he perceived the violent emotion against which she was contending, and regarding her with a look of tender compassion, considered how he might communicate his information with the least pain to his anxious auditor. "'The Chevalier and my son,' said he, "'were introduced to each other at the table of a brother officer.' at whose house I also met him, and invited him to my own, whenever he should be disengaged. I did not then know that he had formed an acquaintance with a set of men, a disgrace to their species, who live by plunder and pass their lives in continual debauchery. I know several of the Chevalier's family, resident at Paris, and consider them as sufficient pledges for his introduction to my own. But you are ill. I will leave the subject. No, sir, said Emily. I beg you will proceed. I am only distressed." only, said the Count, with emphasis. However, I will proceed. I soon learned that these, his associates, had drawn him into a course of dissipation, from which he appeared to have neither the power nor the inclination to extricate himself. He lost large sums at the gaming-table, he became infatuated with play, and was ruined. I spoke tenderly of this to his friends, who assured me that they had remonstrated with him, till they were weary. I afterwards learned that in consideration of his talents for play, which were generally successful when unopposed by the tricks of villainy, that in consideration of these the party had initiated him into the secrets of their trade, and allotted him a share of their profits. Impossible! said Emily suddenly. But, pardon me, sir, I scarcely know what I say. Allow for the distress of my mind. I must, indeed, I must believe that you have not been truly informed. The Chevalier had— doubtless enemies, who misrepresented him. I should be most happy to believe so, replied the Count, but I cannot. Nothing short of conviction and a regard for your happiness could have urged me to repeat these unpleasant reports. Emily was silent. She recollected Valancourt's sayings on the preceding evening, 
which discovered the pangs of self-reproach, and seemed to confirm all that the Count had related. Yet she had not fortitude enough to dare conviction. Her heart was overwhelmed with anguish at the mere suspicion of his guilt, and she could not endure a belief of it. After a silence the Count said, "'I perceive, and can allow for, your want of conviction. It is necessary I should give some proof of what I have asserted but this I cannot do without subjecting one who is very dear to me to danger. "'What is the danger you apprehend, sir?' said Emily. "'If I can prevent it, you may safely confide in my honour. "'On your honour I am certain I can rely,' said the Count, "'but can I trust your fortitude? "'Do you think you can resist the solicitation of a favoured admirer "'when he pleads in affliction for the name of one who has robbed him of a blessing?' "'I shall not be exposed to such a temptation, sir.' said Emily, with modest pride, for I cannot favour one whom I must no longer esteem. I, however, readily give my word. Tears, in the meantime, contradicted her first assertion, and she felt that time and effort only could eradicate an affection which had been formed on virtuous esteem and cherished by habit and difficulty. "'I will trust you, then,' said the Count, for conviction is necessary to your peace, and cannot, I perceive, be obtained without this confidence." My son has too often been an eye-witness of the Chevalier's ill-conduct. He was very near being drawn in by it. He was indeed drawn into the commission of many follies. But I rescued him from guilt and destruction. Judge then, Mademoiselle Saint-Aubert, whether a father, who had nearly lost his only son to the example of the Chevalier, has not, from conviction, reason to warn those whom he esteems against trusting their happiness in such hands. I have myself seen the Chevalier engaged in deep play with men whom I almost shuddered to look upon. If you still doubt, I will refer to you to my son." "'I must not doubt what you have yourself witnessed,' replied Emily, sinking with grief, or what you assert. But the Chevalier has perhaps been drawn only into a transient folly, which he may never repeat. If you had known the justness of his former principles, you would allow for my present incredulity." "'Alas!' observed the Count. It is difficult to believe that which will make us wretched. But I will not soothe you by flattering and false hopes. We all know how fascinating the vice of gaming is, and how difficult it is also to conquer habits. The Chevalier might perhaps reform for a while, but he would soon relapse into dissipation, for I fear not only the bonds of habit would be powerful, but that his morals are corrupted. And why should I conceal from you that play is not his only vice? He appears to have a taste for every vicious pleasure." The Count hesitated and paused. While Emily endeavoured to support herself, as with increasing perturbation she expected what he might further say. A long pause of silence ensued, during which he was visibly agitated. At length he said, "'It would be a cruel delicacy that could prevail with me to be silent, and I will inform you that the Chevalier's extravagance has brought him twice into the prisons of Paris from whence he was last extricated, as I was told upon authority, which I cannot doubt, by a well-known Parisian countess, with whom he continued to reside when I left Paris. He paused again, and looking at Emily perceived her countenance change, and that she was falling from the seat. He caught her, but she had fainted, and he called loudly for assistance. They were, however, beyond the hearing of his servants at the chateau, and he feared to leave her while he went thither for assistance, yet knew not how otherwise to obtain it till a fountain at no great distance caught his eye, and he endeavoured to support Emily against the tree under which he had been sitting, while he went thither for water. But again he was perplexed, for he had nothing near him in which water could be brought. But while with increased anxiety he watched her, he thought he perceived in her countenance symptoms of returning life. It was long, however, before she revived, and then she found herself supported, not by the Count, but by Valancourt, who was observing her with looks of earnest apprehension and who now spoke to her in a tone tremulous with his anxiety. At the sound of his well-known voice she raised her eyes, but presently closed them, and a faintness again came over her. The Count, with a look somewhat stern, waved him to withdraw, but he only sighed heavily, and called on the name of Emily, as he again held the water that had been brought to her lips. On the Count's repeating his action, and accompanying it with words, Valancourt answered him with a look of deep resentment, and refused to leave the place till she should revive, or to resign her for a moment to the care of any person. In the next instant his conscience seemed to inform him of what had been the subject of the Count's conversation with Emily, and indignation flashed in his eyes. But it was quickly repressed, and succeeded by an expression of serious anguish that induced the Count to regard him with more pity than resentment, 
and the view of which so much affected Emily when she again revived that she yielded to the weakness of tears. But she soon restrained them, and, exerting her resolution to appear recovered, she rose, thanked the Count and Henry, with whom Valancourt had entered the garden, for their care, and moved towards the chateau, without noticing Valancourt, who, heart-struck by her manner, exclaimed in a low voice, "'Good God, how have I deserved this? What has been said to occasion this change?' Emily, without replying, but with increased emotion, quickened her steps. "'What has thus disordered you, Emily?' said he, as he still walked by her side. "'Give me a few moments' conversation, I entreat you. I am very miserable.' Though this was spoken in a low voice, it was overheard by the Count, who immediately replied that Mademoiselle St. Aubert was then too much indisposed to attend to any conversation, but that he would venture to promise she would see Monsieur Valancourt on the morrow if she was better. Valancourt's cheek was crimson. He looked haughtily at the Count, and then at Emily, with successive expressions of surprise, grief, and supplication, which she could neither misunderstand or resist, and she said languidly, "'I shall be better to-morrow.' and if you wish to accept the Count's permission, I will see you then. "'See me!' exclaimed Valancourt, as he threw a glance of mingled pride and resentment upon the Count, and then seeming to recollect himself, he added, "'But I will come, madam. I will accept the Count's permission.' When they reached the door of the chateau, he lingered a moment, for his resentment was now fled, and then, with a look so expressive of tenderness and grief that Emily's heart was not proof against it, he bade her good morning, and bowing slightly to the Count, disappeared. Emily withdrew to her own apartment, under such oppression of heart as she had seldom known, when she endeavoured to recollect all that the Count had told, to examine the probability of the circumstances he himself believed, and to consider of her future conduct toward Valancourt. But when she attempted to think, her mind refused to control, and she could only feel that she was miserable. One moment she sunk under the conviction that Valancourt was no longer the same, whom she had so tenderly loved, the idea of whom had hitherto supported her under affliction, and cheered her with the hope of happier days. But a fallen, a worthless character whom she must teach herself to despise, if she could not forget. Then, unable to endure this terrible supposition, she rejected it, and disdained to believe him capable of conduct such as the Count had described, to whom she believed he had been misrepresented by some artful enemy and there were moments when she even ventured to doubt the integrity of the Count himself, and to suspect that he was influenced by some selfish motive to break her connection with Valancourt. But this was the error of an instant only. The Count's character, which she had heard spoken of by Dupont and many other persons, and had herself observed, enabled her to judge and forbade the supposition. Had her confidence indeed been less, there appeared to be no temptation to betray him into conduct so treacherous and so cruel nor did reflection suffer her to preserve the hope that Valancourt had been misrepresented to the Count, who had said that he spoke chiefly from his own observation and from his son's experience. She must part from Valancourt, therefore, for ever. For what of either happiness or tranquillity could she expect with a man whose tastes were degenerated into low inclinations, and to whom vice has become habitual, whom she must no longer esteem, though the remembrance of what he once was, and the long habit of loving him, would render it very difficult for her to despise him? Oh, Valancourt, she would exclaim, having been separated for so long, do we meet only to be miserable, only to part for ever. Amidst all the tumult of her mind, she remembered pertinaciously the seeming candor and simplicity of his conduct on the preceding night, and had she dared to trust her own heart, it would have led her to hope much from this. Still, she could not resolve to dismiss him for ever without obtaining further proof of his ill conduct. Yet she saw no probability of procuring it, if indeed proof more positive was possible. Something, however, it was necessary to decide upon, and she almost determined to be guided in her opinion solely by the manner with which Valancourt should receive her hints concerning his late conduct. Thus passed the hours till dinner-time, when Emily, struggling against the pressure of her grief, dried her tears and joined the family at table, where the Count preserved towards her the most delicate attention. But the Countess and Mademoiselle Béarn having looked for a moment with surprise on her dejected countenance, began as usual to talk of trifles, while the eyes of Lady Blanche asked much of her friend, who could only reply by a mournful smile. Emily withdrew as soon after dinner as possible, and was followed by the Lady Blanche, whose anxious inquiries, however, she found herself quite unequal to answer, and whom she entreated to spare her on the subject of her distress. 
To converse on any topic was now indeed so extremely painful to her that she soon gave up the attempt, and Blanche left her with pity of the sorrow, which she perceived she had no power to assuage. Emily secretly determined to go to her convent in a day or two, for company, especially that of the Countess and Mademoiselle Bayern, was intolerable to her, in the present state of her spirits. And in the retirement of the convent, as well as the kindness of the abbess, she hoped to recover the command of her mind, and to teach it resignation to the event which she too plainly perceived was approaching. To have lost Valancourt by death, or to have seen him married to a rival, would, she thought, have given her less anguish than a conviction of his unworthiness, which must terminate in misery to himself, and which robbed her even of the solitary image her heart so long had cherished. These painful reflections were interrupted for a moment by a note from Valancourt, written in evident distraction of mind, entreating that she would permit him to see her on the approaching evening, instead of the following morning, a request which occasioned her so much agitation that she was unable to answer it. She wished to see him, and to terminate her present state of suspense, yet shrunk from the interview, and incapable of deciding for herself, she at length sent to beg a few moments' conversation with the Count in his library, where she delivered to him the note and requested his advice. After reading it, he said that if she believed herself well enough to support the interview, his opinion was that for the relief of both parties it ought to take place that evening. "'His affection for you is undoubtedly a very sincere one,' added the Count, "'and he appears so much distressed, and you, my amiable friend, are so ill at ease, that the sooner the affair is decided, the better.' Emily replied, therefore, to Valancourt that she would see him, and then exerted herself in endeavours to attain fortitude and composure to bear her through the approaching scene, a scene so afflictingly the reverse of any to which she had looked forward. End of Volume 3, Chapter 13b